Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From the Arcadian Court in downtown Toronto, welcome to the continuation of the 112th season of the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us either through our webcast, our podcast, or on Rogers Television, welcome to our meeting today. Before our distinguished speaker is introduced, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our head table to you. And I'd ask that each guest please rise for a brief moment and then be seated as your name is called. And I'd ask that the audience refrain from applause, please, until the head table guests have all been introduced. So let's start with our honoured speaker, Mr. Kalen Rovanescu, the President and CEO, Air Canada. Mr. Rupert Duchesne, the Group Chief Executive of AMIA. Mr. Bob Dorrance, the Chairman, CEO and President of TD Securities. Mr. William Braithwaite, Chairman, Steichman Elliott, LLP. Ms. Catherine Charlton, the past president of the Empire Club and in fact the first female president of the Empire Club. We wish we could say that was in 1897, but it's uh, wonderful to have you here, Catherine. Mr. Colin Lynch, the vice president, strategy and growth executive office, Greystone Managed Investments, director, Empire Club of Canada. Mr. Anthony Melman, president and CEO of Acasta Capital. Ms. Barbara Jessen, President and CEO of Jessen Communications and a director of the Empire Club of Canada. Mr. Barry Campbell, founder and CEO of Campbell Strategies. And my name is Gordon McIver. I am the executive director of the National Executive Forum on Public Property. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table. We're also very pleased to have with us today a group of students who are joining us from the aviation program at the University of Waterloo. Students, would you please rise and be recognized? Welcome. There are few companies in Canada that are truly iconic and have played a fundamental role in shaping our country's history, culture, recreational pastimes, and even basic life choices. There are even fewer that are well known or are as well known around the world as they are here at home. But when the federal government created TransCanada Airlines in 1936 and began operating transcontinental flight routes two years later, they knew that this was going to be a game changer in the way that Canadians lived, worked, and vacationed, uniting the second largest landmass, the second largest nation on the planet, in a way that had not been done since the completion of the first National Railway back in 1885. At the Empire Club, which has always been a reflection of this country's history, and even at times its mood, it was therefore not surprising that one of the most significant speeches of 1938 was given its title quite simply by the name of its new company, Trans-Canada Airlines. The speaker was the vice president of the new company, Philip G. Johnson, who reminded the audience that flight was no longer just a military occupation, and that, as it had been during the Great War, and in fact, that the company's first and most important mission was the delivery of mail, and that passenger flight would also now become increasingly important. Here's a quote from that memorable speech delivered at this very podium 80 years ago. The task of putting a transcontinental airline across Canada is really a three-party proposition. First of all, the company that is charged with the operation and the organization of the actual flying. Secondly, the government that is represented by the Post Office Department and the Department of Transport. The Post Office furnishes our payload and the Department of, Trans of Transport the ground facilities necessary to carry out this work. The third party, of course, is the public. No matter how well the first two partners cooperate or how well we do our job, the company cannot succeed, cannot be a success, or the service a success unless the public, in fact, uses it and uses it intelligently. By intelligent use of the air service for your mail, for your express, and for your passengers, I mean to use it when, the services, when it services an economic purpose, not just because of a fad that passes from day to day. And I'm sure that our air service will serve an economic need in Canada and that through such use, TransCanada Airlines, which is your company, will succeed. Now, of course, Mr. Johnson was entirely correct in noting that this was far more than a fad. And we all know the milestones that the company had which followed this momentous date. The rebranding to the new name of Air Canada in 1965. The complex privatization that occurred in 1988 the acquisition of Canadian Airlines in 2000, and the subsequent growth, marked by a few financial hiccups and even one heavily mediatized bankruptcy in 2003, which followed. 
Today, Air Canada belongs to that very select club of international carriers that flies to all six inhabited continents and manages to do so with one of the most sterling safety and service records of any airline in the world. This week, we welcome the man who has been at the helm of this very successful international company for several years, Mr. Kalen Rovanescu. Last Friday, in fact, some of you will know that he celebrated his seventh year in that position. He originally joined the company back in 2000 after a highly successful career as a managing partner at the law firm Steichman Elliott in Montreal, where he practiced law for over 20 years. <clears throat> Well, he left the company for a few years to co-found and manage Genuity Capital Markets, an independent investment bank, his heart was obviously still flying on the wings of Air Canada. And when he rejoined the company, it was as though he'd never left. He had already led the restructuring of the company in 2003-2004, and now he wanted to take the airline to the next level, going far beyond financial stability and growing into what industry associations have named the best international airline in North America, and indeed one of Canada's best managed companies. Perhaps this leadership ability comes from the very impressive list of different operational areas that Mr. Ovenescu has managed at the airline. Legal, information and technology, e-commerce, human resources, labor, government affairs, communications, marketing, even corporate secretary. If anyone in Canada knows more about the aviation and passenger airline business than our guests today, we at the Empire Club have not yet discovered this person. In fact, our 1938 speaker who addressed us on the future importance of Air Canada's predecessor company would have called him a renaissance man, an individual who has all of the multiple and complex skill sets in place to be able to invite all Canadians and peoples from around the world to come fly with me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our great pleasure to welcome to the podium today the President and CEO of Air Canada, Mr. Kalen Robinescu. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon. That was very, very nice and uh, generous on your part uh, to uh, tell a little bit of our history and uh, a little bit of the richness of, uh, of what this company uh, has, uh, has meant to so many people for so many years. And in fact, it's actually a great segue. You're a great uh, setup man. So if ever you're looking for a second career, there's one waiting for you. Bonjour à tous. Uh, il est pour moi un grand plaisir d'être parmi, parmi vous aujourd'hui et uh, de vous voir en si grand nombre. In September 2010, just about five and a half years ago, and again, as I say, this is a great segue from what Gordon just mentioned. As we are, uh, as we are coming out of uh, the near-death experiences of 2008 and 2009, I was invited to speak at the Banff uh, global Business Forum, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. And rather than talk about the past challenges, because I, I thought that it was already, you know, we were getting pretty tired about hearing about the challenges, the word challenge in the same breath as airlines, I selected as my topic becoming a global champion in today's market. Air Canada had just come off of the two worst years in commercial aviation. Jet fuel had spiked to over $140 a barrel and was hovering then well over $100 a barrel. We'd come off of a net loss of a billion dollars, our pension deficit exceeded four billion dollars, and our stock price was at less than one dollar. So I called this global champion goal aspirational and was, quote, confident we could achieve it. But I promised our team that we would not spike the ball on the 10-yard line. Others had more descriptive expressions for our global champion ambition such as delusional. Some, in fact, wondered what we were smoking and whether our plight qualified us for medicinal marijuana. <laughs> and you'll remember, of course, those were the very early days of the discussion around legalizing marijuana. By 2010, Canadian business had already lost many leading global icons from diverse fields such as telecommunications, manufacturing, retail, mining, energy, steel, breweries, high-tech, and there had been much debate about the so-called hollowing out of Canada. So I thought then that I would take the theme of global leadership and build it into somewhat of an internal Air Canada challenge and indeed mantra for our board, our senior executives, our managers, our line employees. To understand how successful champions in other industries, like Amazon, 
like Apple, Google, Samsung, Boeing, how these companies were able to achieve what they had achieved. Why couldn't Air Canada, a then 75-year-old company, be capable of really thinking big despite the challenges of 2008 and 2009? And why couldn't we make the case for being a global champion coming out of the very deep recession that we had just been in? Were we relevant enough to be a global champion? Were we global enough? What is a global champion anyways? What role does a welcoming regulatory, legislative, and taxation regime play? How much does sustainable revenue growth and bottom line profitability matter? How important is it to be capable of competing with the best in the world in terms of cost, product, service, and network? Frankly, with the history and brand strength of Air Canada, simply having everyone in our organization asking themselves these very basic questions was already half the battle. Moreover, we learned two very valuable lessons. That one cannot be shy when all is bleakest. We had to take risk and to move quickly to seize opportunities arising from the ashes of 2008 and 2009. And secondly, that one must play to one's strengths rather than see one's legacy as a weakness. We were not a 10-year-old low-cost carrier with a clean sheet of paper, nor could we pretend to be one. We were 75 years old and one of the world's leading international carriers with very many legacy strengths. So how have we fared on our journey to be a global champion five and a half years into it? Here's our report card. Now, frankly, I must confess that whether or not we actually were ever to be recognized as a so-called global champion was almost irrelevant. It was the very aspiration and ethos of continuous improvement that mattered to me. The setting of very basic priorities that would put us back on the track towards that global champion moniker. Global champions should sustain profitable growth. Six years ago, our revenues were 10 billion, and in 2015, our annual revenues were about 14 billion, a 40% top line growth for a legacy company now nearly 80 years old. Our earnings, or EBITDA, was 2.5 billion last year versus 679 million in 2009, an increase of 270%. We now have a pension solvency surplus of 1.3 billion versus a deficit that was 2.7 billion at the end of 2009. And our share price is now up more than 800% over, eight, over 2009. We've just completed our most profitable year ever with adjusted net income of $1.2 billion. Global champions should create meaningful employment globally. We now employ over 28,000 people, making us one of the largest private sector employers in the country. Our people work in 29 countries around the world on all continents, as uh, you just heard. Global champions should have a powerful and well-understood brand. On a busy day, we can fly more than 140,000 people, or a total of 41 million people a year, to 200 destinations worldwide. We're now among the top 15 or 20 largest carriers in the world, out of about 1,000. More importantly, however, we've grown to this size despite Canada's modest and dispersed population base. And the center of our focus is right here in Toronto, which has emerged as our primary global hub. The stakes for Toronto are higher than ever because the competitive field is broader than Canada alone. It's global. And the prize is much bigger than for just Air Canada and our stakeholders. Global champions are significant players in terms of the economy. They drive economic growth. We spent roughly $9.5 billion on products and services in 2015, approximately half of that in Canada. Last year, we booked 475,000 hotel rooms for our employees. In Ontario alone, we have 12,000 active employees, plus 2,200 are subsidiaries and partners, Air Canada Rouge, Air Canada Vacations, Jazz, and Sky Regional, all of whom, in turn, spin off incremental economic activity. And an interesting 2013 study by PricewaterhouseCoopers in the UK found that there was a very direct correlation between airline growth and GDP growth inbound tourism, trade, and foreign direct investment. This is why around the world countries are investing heavily in airport infrastructure. 
They want to create hubs to draw in global traffic flows so travelers can converge and connect and possibly stay to visit or even set up a business. It's a vicious circle. More flights mean more customers, which in turn support more flights, and so on. All the while generating incremental economic activity. Holland is a great case study for us. It's a country of about 17 million people, about half of Canada, that had 58 and a half million passengers travel through its main Amsterdam Schiphol airport last year. From Schiphol, travelers can fly directly to 322 destinations, almost double Pearson's, and we're working hard and fast to spread our wings to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. As a country, we're playing catch up, but there's still a lot of opportunity for Canadian airports as the global industry is projected to grow steadily over the next 20 years. International Air Transport Association, IATA, projects that with a expected 3.8% average annual growth in demand, passenger numbers will reach 7 billion by 2034, which is exactly twice the number that flew in 2015. Global champions should have an uber-engaged workforce, and I'm not referring to the ride-sharing types here. Here, too, we've seen a major change at Air Canada. We now have unprecedented 10-year deals, 10-year labor agreements with most of our unions. We've been named one of Canada's top 100 employers for the third year in a row, and our employees voted us one of the winners in Glass, Glassdoor's 2016 Employees' Choice Awards as one of the best places to work in Canada. And this would frankly have been unimaginable six or seven years ago. Les chefs de file mondiaux contribuent de manière durable et significative à la diversité et à l'inclusivité. La promotion de la diversité est non seulement la bonne chose à faire, mais également un avantage concurrentiel. Diverses études le démontrent, et comme l'une d'elles l'a conclu, une combinaison d'outils peut être plus puissante que les outils eux-mêmes. Ce, ce principe s'applique tout particulièrement à Toronto, qui est l'une des villes les plus multiculturelles du monde. Nous sommes fiers que nos employés parlent une soixantaine de langues. Pour vous donner un exemple de mise à profit de la diversité dans la vraie vie, nous avons exploité cette année 13 vols pour amener des réfugiés syriens au pays. Nous avons pu affecter à nos appareils des employés qui parlent arabe, ce qui, pour nombre de ces familles, est rendu plus agréable ce difficile voyage. Je suis convaincu qu'en rencontrant d'emblée des Canadiens qui parlent leur langue, ces nouveaux arrivants ont découvert d'une belle façon le multiculturalisme canadien. Enfin, nous sommes très heureux d'avoir été récemment reconnus comme l'un des employeurs les plus favorables à la diversité au Canada. Global champions find unique ways to exploit their unique selling points, their USPs, and of cutting edge products and services. Since 2010, we've been very determined to re-engage our customers in a meaningful way and challenge the organization to see if we have what it takes to not only excel once in a while when our backs are against the wall, but to consistently excel from year to year. We've got the benefit of great geography. Vancouver is a natural gateway to the Pacific, and Toronto, of course, benefits from being located near the center of North America as a superb pivot point for customers transiting between domestic, transborder, and international flights. We've invested heavily in new equipment with a $9 billion capital expenditure program, mostly for new generation aircraft. We will have one of the youngest fleets in the sky. And we intend to press this advantage as we keep taking delivery of the 37 Boeing 787 Dreamliner aircraft we have on order. Complementing these will be our new narrow body aircraft, including the Boeing 737 MAX, starting in 2017, and the Bombardier C-Series 2019. While our other unique selling points are our network and geographic competitive advantage, we also offer service on the only four-star network international carrier in North America. Our next generation cabin features new live flat suites in international business class and the first dedicated premium economy cabin in North America. Recently, we completed the installation of Wi-Fi on all our North American flights and announced plans to begin ins installing satellite Wi-Fi on our wide-body international fleet later this year. We also plan to spend 300 million, part of that 9 billion, in 2016 to refurbish 
our existing Boeing 777s and bring them up to the new standard. Our efforts since 2010 were recognized through a series of industry awards, including Best Airline in North America, as you just heard, for five straight years, based on a worldwide survey conducted by the independent research firm Skytrax. Global champions embrace risk, seize new opportunities, innovate and expand. In our case, we took a sizable risk to launch Air Canada Rouge as a leisure brand in the face of Air Canada's premium brand and conventional offering. But Rouge has been an amazing success, not only contributing significantly to our profitability, but also enabling us to maintain or expand our leisure routes, enter new markets to sun destinations, to Europe and Asia, and also create a targeted opportunity for our workforce to expand and seize new opportunities. It also gives us amazing flexibility to deploy aircraft to different markets in winter and summer at a much lower cost throughout the whole year. Global champions foster a culture of success. They feel like and behave like winners. Being nimble and having both flexibility and results orientation is part of your DNA. And this is what I consider perhaps our greatest success since 2010, changing the very culture at Air Canada, as a corporate culture sets the tone for everything that you do. In our business, a very complex service business, this entails giving employees more discretion and empowering them to make decisions, to create a culture of entrepreneurship and performance orientation. Not easy for a company such as ours, which has historically been rule-bound and process-driven. Basically, we needed to become a big company, behaving more like a small company, stealing some very basic entrepreneurial drivers. Global champions must have a truly global mindset. Most of our growth over the last five years has been international. We've sought to shake off parochialism and have our company adopt that needed global mindset. We've increased our capacity outside Canada by more than 47%. Last year, and again this year, fully 90% of our growth will be in international markets. We're investing in long-range aircraft for the global arena. We're competing with all global players. We're hiring based on global skills and ambitions. We are not willing to compromise our future based on the prejudices and restrictions of the past. Since 2009, we've launched non-stop service from Toronto to more than 30 destinations. While this has included new Canadian city pairs and some U.S. and Sun destinations, the most exciting have been our international routes. Among these are non-stop flights from Toronto to Athens, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Copenhagen, Delhi, Dubai, Edinburgh, Tokyo, Haneda, Istanbul, Manchester, Rio de Janeiro, and Venice. This summer, new routes will include Glasgow, Budapest, Warsaw, and Prague. We're not afraid to have our Toronto hub compete with the likes of rival hubs for example, in New York or Chicago. So we've been working very hard with the GTA to dramatically improve the connection process to better compete for international connecting traffic. That is traffic flying from one country to another country by connecting in Canada. And we're seeing meaningful growth in this type of business at all of our hubs. Let me give you an example. For someone in Boston traveling to Asia, there is no nonstop service, so they'll have to connect somewhere. Due to the curvature of the earth and Toronto's location, Air Canada can offer very competitive, if not the fastest, elapsed travel times via Toronto. Even more, connecting through Toronto is easy compared to going through a major U.S. hub, especially for inbound travel, because customers do not need to get their bags for customs inspection until they reach their final destination. The Canadian market is, of course, limited in size and is already quite mature. There is therefore a huge opportunity in the international connecting traffic that flies to and from U.S. airports where Canada has open skies. At present, Air Canada has less than a 1% share of such traffic other than traffic flying on U.S. carriers. If we could boost this to even 1.5%, that would translate into an additional 1.68 million passengers or approximately $600 million a year. Global champions support other key industries where a win-win outcome as possible. We are proud to be the first major North American carrier to order Bombardier's C-Series. We believe it sends an important signal to the market that should give other airlines the confidence to purchase this extremely efficient next-generation aircraft. Moreover, 
We also think it's extremely important to support the Canadian aerospace industry and invest in Canadian jobs and technology, provided both Air Canada and the industry can stand to gain. At list prices, our order is valued at $3.8 billion for the firm order alone. This is a substantial commitment to the C-Series, which is not simply a, sing a signature aircraft program for Bombardier, but also one of the most important innovative technology projects in Canada today. Global champions invest and manage their business for the long term, not for quick hits or short-term trading opportunities. Think, and I'm not looking at anyone in particular, by the way, in this room. Think about the amazing business that Amazon has been building with virtually no profit for years. Airlines in particular operate over a long, virtually generational cycle. For example, aircraft purchasing. First, you typically study an aircraft's requirements to try to understand what the market will require several years in advance. Once you order an aircraft, it typically takes four or five years until delivery, and of course, you'll have no clue whether or not the universe will have changed by then or whether you might be in the middle of a new recession, for example. The aircraft then typically has a life cycle of 25 years. It amounts to a serious commitment that cannot be measured significantly in any given quarter. Therefore, an investment time frame has to match this long-term strategy. And more and more well-known investors, such as Larry Fink, the CEO at BlackRock, and many of our own pension funds here in Canada, are increasingly speaking to the importance of long-termism in both investing and in managing businesses. I wholly endorse that. We need to run our business and make our capital allocation decisions based on sustainable profitability in the long-term interests of our stakeholders. A level, a level playing field is crucial for global success. True global champions from other countries are often unconstrained in their ability to compete and win based on exploiting their strengths. In this area, the public policy framework in Canada has not always been favorable, and in particular with respect to our industry and with respect to Air Canada. Federal government continues to collect billions of dollars in hefty airport rent on facilities that operators have now paid for many times over. In Ontario, government has imposed a 148% increase on fuel excise taxes. The industry carries burdensome security surcharges that are not reinvested in the industry. Policies such as these translate into higher level of costs that indirectly impede economic activity. Moreover, in Air Canada's case in particular, our company has been subject to some rather unique provisions of a 30-year-old privatization statute, the Air Canada Public Participation Act, dating from the time the company ceased to be a crown corporation three years ago. These include obligations for mandatory provisions in our articles as to where we are required to perform aircraft maintenance. No other airline in Canada, or to our knowledge, any private sector airline anywhere in the world is subject to restrictions such as those imposed on Air Canada. Not WestJet, not Porter, not Air Transat, not Sunwing, not British Airways, not American Airlines, not Cathay Pacific, not Emirates, etc., etc., etc. Fundamentally, to continue to succeed and thrive in the global marketplace and to create high skill job opportunities in Canada beyond those held by our 28,000 employees. We need a level playing field and the same ability to manage our business and affairs as our competition. Last month, the federal government tabled a bill to amend and modernize that Air Canada Act dating from privatization, which we believe was long overdue. The amended act recognizes the reality that Air Canada is a private sector company, not an instrument of state policy, owned by private sector interests, which operates in a highly competitive global industry that has undergone dramatic transformation over the past three decades. It's also recognition that the best jobs are those that are created by strong private sector employers. For employers to thrive, let alone to develop into the kind of global champion that this country needs, there must be a competitive, business-friendly landscape, one where companies such as ours are permitted to compete with the best in the world on a level playing field with the market determining costs and inputs. We can't wring our hands continuously and wonder 
why Canada has hollowed out its global champions without uh, starting to deal with some of these challenges. In Air Canada, Canada has an iconic global brand that has succeeded through eight decades of incredible change to product, network, markets, and customer expectations. And while we may or may not be anywhere near that elusive 10-yard 10 10 line near the global champion goal, I can tell you that we are and will continue to embrace that change. There is no risk of spiking the ball prematurely. We intend to keep evolving, innovating, and reinventing ourselves to find that uh, new, new, as they like to say in technology, playbook, that global champion playbook, and to stay ahead of the curve. There is a world of possibilities out there waiting us, and the best, I believe, is still yet to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Kaylin. Excellent speech. And here to uh, express our collective appreciation, Mr. Colin Lynch. Thank you. On behalf of the uh, Empire Club and the folks assembled here today, I'd like to thank Kaylin for his speech. There are many companies in Canada that, inspire, that aspire to a global platform, that aspire to greatness. Few have actually accomplished that feat. What we've heard today is an outline of the transformation that you have led in Air Canada and a roadmap to accomplish even greater things in the future. So thank you for taking the time to share it with us today. Thanks very much, Colin. Uh, thank you as well, ladies and gentlemen, to our generous sponsor today, AMIA, for being our, our event sponsor. We'd also like to thank the National Post, which many of you will know is our national print media sponsor, and Rogers Television, our national broadcaster. <clears throat> We'd also like to thank uh, MediaEvents.ca, which is Canada's online event space, for live webcasting today's event at a global level. Please follow us on Twitter at Empire underscore Club. You can also uh, join us or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And uh, please join us again. For those of you that are not regular guests at the Empire Club, we welcome you to come back. We've got lots of great events lined up. Uh, tomorrow, in fact, we have a remarkable story. Jen Westcott will be here, the president uh, and CEO of Spirits Canada uh, and the Association of Canadian Distillers, talking about how Canada got to be the uh, top whiskey producer in the world. Uh, we have the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, who will be joining us this Friday and talking about, the, obviously, the uh, recent budget. That'll be April 8th at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. And we just booked our uh, first speaker in the sesquicentennial series, which is Canada's 150th birthday, which you all know is next year. And that will occur this June 3rd. And we've invited Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, the head of the Supreme Court of Canada, who will be talking about uh, the role of the Supreme Court in the past and in the future in shaping many of Canada's moods and aspirations. So we welcome you to, uh, to join us for these events, and thank you especially, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance today. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>